Welcome to the Smart and Sustainable Port Operation Lectures uh, by Rob Zuidwijk. And let me first uh, introduce myself. My affiliations are that I'm Professor of Global Supply Chains and Ports at the Rotterdam School of Management at Erasmus University. I'm an academic member of the Top Team Logistics and the ambassador on, uh, on the Smart Port, a collaborative effort between uh, the Universities of Delft and uh, Rotterdam, Erasmus University and uh, the Port uh, stakeholders. And I, I guess these affiliations also already explain a bit my, uh, my interests. Uh, they are indeed related to the port, to multimodal container transportation, uh, relating to the use of information systems uh, for global logistics, and the role of ports in global sustainable supply chains, and these different topics I address using uh, quantitative uh, methods. In the first lecture uh, that we will do on hinterland container logistics and intermodal transportation, we consider the following guiding questions. What are hinterland container logistics systems? What is intermodal transportation and how does it contribute to sustainable performance? Well, let's start with the voyage of a maritime container. So a maritime container is uh, portrayed here as a steel box and that moves uh, in this particular case uh, from the port of Rotterdam to a hinterland destination following a route. Well, this is a navigator. Uh, this looks very familiar to any navigation system that you may use. There is one important distinction in that this uh, particular container is using different modes of transportation. And in fact, different routes that it may choose could indeed be uh, deploying different types of uh, transportation modes. Now, what are these uh, modes? You can certainly think about truck, but uh, we also will discuss uh, as a very important mode of transportation, uh, rail and uh, uh, vessels on inland, uh, inland waterways. This voyage starts though at the port, in the port. Uh, so in the port is an interface between sea and land. And that means that large vessels will bring those containers to the port and also will take them from the port in large quantities. They will be taken off, off, off board and loaded on board uh, by huge uh, cranes, as large as, for example, the Erasmus Bridge in uh, Rotterdam. Uh, and then those containers will be put in a stack in the middle. Uh, the picture that you see on this uh, slide actually indicates this process uh, in a simplified manner. In the middle, indeed, we have the stack. Uh, there, the, the containers are put as, uh, as in the buffer and then the containers are forwarded to different transportation modes that I uh, explained uh, earlier. Well, actually, let's look at those different transportation modes in a bit more uh, detail. I had to bring the containers from the port to the final destination or vice versa. They would use different modes of transportation and they each have their own characteristics. Let's focus on capacity. Road we do see that the road infrastructure has a certain capacity and that is actually best explained by the infrastructural capacity itself. Is there, if there's a lot of traffic on the road, that will create congestion and that will show the limitations of that, uh, of that uh, infrastructure. And trucks may be stuck in traffic, uh, so to speak. In inland waterways, it's slightly different. If you look at waterways, they actually look pretty empty. So there must be other reasons and other bottlenecks, if you want, uh, that define the capacity of inland waterways. Well, first of all, we have services that are used. So if, you're, if there are no barges at all at a certain moment in time, you simply don't have any capacity readily available. There are locks and there are bridges, and also the terminals themselves can be bottlenecks in that transportation. So not so much the waterways themselves necessarily, but certain bottlenecks in the system. And for rail, you may see something similar. There we have a combination of person transport and freight transportation. And there, with person transportation having priority, we do see uh, that uh, there are bottlenecks as well. In fact, there is a planning required for freight trains to follow a certain path in space and time and thereby uh, uh, they, they, they need to uh, abide to that and they may need to make sure that they don't uh, pass, let's say, certain thresholds. Otherwise, they will have to wait for a long time until there's again a new opening in that, in that uh, infrastructure. 
And that actually forces real transportation to make use of rather simple point-to-point -point, uh, services instead of a more, uh, let's say, a complicated uh, uh, network of services that could also be very useful. So what we learn here is that each mode of transportation has its own characteristics and its own way of defining capacity. I discussed these various modes of transportation and apparently uh, there, there's a need to have those uh, multiple modes of transportation in place. Well, there is. Uh, having all containers, uh, for example, the last few years, 14 million in the port of Rotterdam, uh, passing through the road transportation infrastructure would simply be impossible. So we need other modes of transportation as well. And in fact, the port authority would like to see more containers uh, on barge, on river vessel, and on train. And in fact, they developed a vision around that, looking at prognostics, and they actually uh, enforced uh, what they call a modal shift. And that means that the market share of, of rail and of, uh, of uh, inland waterways need to increase in the, in the next uh, decades. And we are always almost a decade further, and this development is going somewhat, somewhat slower than expected. Uh, on the other hand, uh, there has been indeed also an incredible growth in containers. So in fact, there are more containers going by, uh, by rail and by inland waterways, but still. And the question is, how are, let's say, the participants in, in the container transportation helping here? Well, to give you an example, one of the port operators in the port of Rotterdam decided to build a network, as depicted here on this, uh, on this uh, picture uh, uh, that you see here. Uh, we see, indeed, the port of Rotterdam as a node in the network. We see several inland nodes, which are inland ports, and they're connected through transportation links. And each of these transportation links can be used by barges and by, uh, by, rail, by, by, by trains. And the idea is that this extended gate, as we call it, the extended gate concept, uh, helps those different modes of transportation to, to, to bring containers and being stimulated to do so. How does that work? Well, uh, it works as follows, that is, these extended gates uh, are decided upon by the port operator, and the port operator will indeed uh, decide on the transportation. By that means, they have expanded their business model, they've brought their control from the terminal in the port toward the entire transportation network, and they define and control the services to those different uh, hinterland destinations, uh, as depicted in this uh, picture, and thereby they can decide to put containers with agreement of the owner of the cargo of the containers, uh, though, to bring those containers by barge and rail to these various destinations. And they also brought in the following attractive element, all kinds of administrative uh, procedures, like customs procedures, can be postponed until the moment that the container leaves the gate of the hinterland uh, terminal, instead of the hinterland gate, uh, gate at the deep sea terminal. And that's why they call it the extended gate. <clears throat> now, once you make such a solution where you allow containers to, 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 to uh, uh, fi finalize procedures only after they leave the hinterland uh, gates, you need to still need to decide how to design a network, right? So you need to think about which inland terminals are best are most appropriate to be part of this network. And if I want to develop a uh, transportation service on this network, what capacity a frequency on the corridors, uh, the, the links between the deep sea terminal and the inland terminals should I develop and how should I price those uh, services? Because you're not only pricing now for the handling on the container, you're also pricing for the transportation to uh, the hinterland destinations. This modal split, this, this movement of cargo from the road to uh, river, uh, rivers and rails, is, is something that, uh, that uh, can be done for various reasons, to relieve congestion on, on the road network, but also to, to have lower emissions. And although there is some discussion ongoing uh, there for various reasons, uh, if you look at recent developments, for example, the European Green Deal, this modal split that I just discussed is still very high on the agenda. So it's very relevant in terms of sustainable transportation 
and, and uh, uh, efficient energy use uh, of intermodal transportation. So I'd like to conclude. Uh, so what we've seen uh, in this video is that hinterland logistics systems indeed consist of networks of different uh, modes of transportation that operate uh, uh, jointly. And we see that uh, intermodal transportation is, can, can be very uh, efficient when uh, utilized uh, uh, well uh, from an economies of scale uh, point of view as barges can carry a lot of containers. Uh, and that will also be true, true in terms of uh, emissions. Thank you for your attention.